I was often told that I couldn't have children. So knowing that he came, he's just my miracle child, truly. And I treated him like he was a miracle and that he was loved every single day. The only thing that he ever said he wanted to be since he was a small child, a superhero. That's it. I knew that he was a gift. And that is why he was so exposed to so many things because I have seen the world. I just took my time to see it again through his eyes. Yeah, that's my dude. Shout out to my family. Love you, mama. I love you, daddy. Nah. It really is speaking to the love of my husband and I. I saw him on one day. Seven days later, I saw him again. Seven being the number of completion, seven uh, being the God's perfect number. But more than anything that I raised him on was, how many times do you forgive your enemy? It's seven times 70. Tammy Charles and her son Seven are where we're starting this story. What we originally thought was an isolated incident in a suburban Louisville school district ended up being about so much more. According to the Department of Education, 37% of black kids say that they've been bullied over race, the way they talk, or even a disability. And Seven is one of those kids. We backed up his entire story through videos, school records, and police reports. This is what happened to Seven. The very first thing, a little girl called him a nigger on the bus. And then, fast forward to next week, he's on the bus and the little girl says, um, well, you know that nigger can't fight. He gets off the bus, runs to his dad and says, Daddy, I got choked on the bus, but don't be mad because I think he has a mental problem. kid put him in a headlock to the point where students on the bus were screaming for the bus driver to stop. The bus had to be pulled over. What is the district policy involving physical contact? We individualize cases. Um, we have the people in place with our bullying prevention team that can review um, complaints or concerns from families and they work with our schools to resolve those matters. Children are safe in Jefferson County Public Schools. There have been reviews in the past um, for how um, investigations were looked at, and we have done different things to address that and make sure that everything is looked at through a, a, a very thorough lens. I tell parents all the time, don't put your child in that position. So if they're complaining about it, go up to that school and demand that that school do something. I looked to the principal kind of like an overhead, like, did you get my message? And she just gave me this, it's been taken care of. I was at his school average twice a week for lunch. I volunteered for everything. It broke down the false security that I had that I am this involved, they see me this much. And for that, maybe my kid would have some sort of exception I know that I can get it out of my mind and, and tomorrow's like a better day so I can still make friends with him. 77 days of the first time my son was bullied to the day he died. 77 days in between. This is why my son is dead. I said, well, what did the teacher say? And he said, well, I want you to tell her to stop. And she said, well, how can I help her if your mom has called the principal and the principal's talked to her mom and if your mom can't do it and the principal can't do it, what makes you think that I, that I can stop her? And besides seven, nobody likes a tattletale. He died of being bullied to death. Wow, my kid. There's this idea when you're young, developmentally, you may not understand the permanency of suicide. I don't think sometimes that kids understand there's no coming back from that. This is much younger children. People always say black 
people don't do that? Yes. Here's a picture. I do think black parents in particular, we try to educate our kids about what it means to be black and how people are going to engage you in the world. I don't know that we're able to give them the full extent and teach them to the full degree of what those struggles are gonna be like. What parent expects to have to have a race conversation with a child and the child is five, six years old? I never took the time to teach my son about racial differences, racial inequalities. I never did that because he was 10. I want this little boy to be a little boy. <laughs> Come on, seven. I went downstairs because he was so funny. He was such a jokester. And then, because at this point, I'm mad, like, boy, where you hiding at, you know? So, something said, look over my shoulder in his room. And there my baby was. But it's back to me. I grab him around his waist and I say, boy, why would you do this? And I remember saying out loud, God, why my son? Why my son? And I heard, just as clear as I'm talking to you, a very nonchalantly put, I gave my son. I promise you, the words that I heard. He was my special child. Everybody's a woulda, coulda, shoulda until it happens to you. Woulda, shoulda, coulda. Wish I woulda, shoulda, coulda had my son. Young male child measuring approximately 46 inches tall and appearing the stated age of seven years. When we say suicide doesn't discriminate, we mean that no one is immune from suicidal ideation, attempts, or even death. I would do anything to have my son back, but Lord knows it's not gonna happen. He was my special child. When I was told I couldn't have no more kids, I had him. So that's why I call him my special baby. He was so full of energy and, and, and he loved dressing in costumes. He'll come out wearing a Batman, you know, mask and Superman cape. The deceased is dressed in a one-piece Batman pajama suit and a pair of black underpants. I felt like my baby just was pushing everything in in that little brain of his, his little, a seven-year-old, dealing with calling a nigger, snagging to, you're ugly, you dress funny. He did not want us to go up there and embarrass him because he didn't want to get nobody in trouble. So he didn't say nothing. He was just dealing with it and praying for them. Young male child measuring approximately 46 inches tall and appearing the stated age of seven years. Everybody's a woulda, coulda, shoulda until it happens to you. Woulda, shoulda, coulda. Wish I woulda, shoulda, coulda had my son. I would do anything to have my son back, but Lord knows it's not gonna happen. Black kids are dying by suicide at rates two times higher than their white peers. And as we started digging into the numbers, we found research and experts were backing up the facts that the numbers that are actually out there aren't even close to the reality of the situation. We started looking into what happened to Jeffrey Taylor after seeing a local report out of San Antonio, Texas. Family prayer? Yeah. Okay, well, let us pray. Who's first? Me. My gun was kept in my Bible case. And at that, that particular day, it was pushed up under my bed. I don't know if he may have just slipped up, you know, when you're in your parents' room and you see, you see something you're not supposed to see. I went straight to the room. I 
I saw my baby laying there like he normally is. But when I looked to the left, I saw my gun. And I saw blood, dry blood on my baby's face. And I just screamed. I just screamed. I yelled and I said, Holy Jeffrey Moore. My baby was hard as a rock. He was hard as a rock. I tried to, I put him back. And all I could do is run. I was screaming. I just kept saying, Jeffrey. Why? I told you to hold on. I was gonna kick. I was gonna take kids. <laughs> but God had something else to store for my baby. That is something that's gonna always stay with me. Pray to the day I die. Hear my baby cry out to me because that was a different cry. At present, it appears to be an accidental event with no clear evidence of foul play or suicide. We know a lot about what works for white youth in terms of preventing suicide, and we just don't have that same evidence base or literature around black youth suicide. We've gone from feeling like uh, suicide really wasn't an issue for black and brown communities to now realizing that black and brown kids and particularly uh, young black males are dying at rates uh, double that of our white peers. I grew up hearing that if you're experiencing anxiety or depression, you know, you just need to pray harder. I didn't have the right to feel anxiety. I didn't have the right to feel emotional pain. We saw uh, the deaths of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. And for black and brown kids that see this over time, uh, that starts to, to, to weigh on anyone. He's gonna have the rest of his life to deal with the Trayvon Martins and Tamir Rice's and all of that. But I want this little boy to be a little boy. <laughs> With my son's death, for me, I have responsibility. And that's the scary part. No one's talking about bullying and suicide because it's so stigmatized. And, and then all of the people who speak to me, the, the survivor's parents, I, for some reason or another, they find me. Y'all got a slew of 800-888 numbers you can call, but you happen to find this 502 number and call me. I'm getting ready to talk to this little girl about being bullied and, and how to feel. And the first thing this little girl asked me, Miss Tammy, do you think Seven's in a better place? Do you think he's happy there? Do you think that I would be more happy where Seven is? I have to do this for them, not for my own child, but for that child and so many others that have called me. I say to them, no, this is exactly why Seven is there so that you can pull on his strength and find the happiness from his strength to live through you. And I just found all this over-the-counter medication. I just took pill after pill. What did you feel when you woke up? Sadness and anger. Kids are suffering in silence. By default, even here, like you as a black child, you are seen as unruly. If you do one thing, it is magnified. I just try to listen to them because you don't 
know what somebody needs exactly until you hear what they have to say. They go to what they know, they go to what they see, and what they see says maybe not living is a solution. I didn't feel as if I had a right to be sad. I didn't feel as if I had a right to not want to be here and to have all these negative emotions because I was living this amazing life, supposedly. And I just didn't feel as if it was validated. And when you don't feel validated, you don't speak up. I go back and look at pictures of myself and you can see it in my eyes. I was sitting there knowing that this was my time, and it was my time to go, and I was very confident in that decision. I just took pill after pill, and I went back into the bedroom. So I just laid down, closed my eyes, and then the following morning I woke up. What did you feel when you woke up? Sadness and anger. I had the burden of knowing I tried to take my own life. Paige Gaines is one of the tens of thousands of survivors of suicide, and now she's trying to help other kids survive as well. Efforts to help kids combat suicide have worked among white children, but for black kids, hasn't done a thing. The numbers are still going up fast. If you see that children, regardless of race, regardless of, of culture, if you see that children are dying um, and they're dying from something that is very often preventable, that should be something that alarms all of us. Kids are suffering in silence, and what do they do? They go to what they know, they go to what they see, and what they see says maybe not living is a solution. There's this lack of preparation often um, from all of the adults in their lives to help them understand the kinds of challenges that they're gonna have to navigate and the extent to which they're gonna have to navigate these challenges. as a black person in the public school system. Mental health will be taught in a way that's like, everybody's the same and I can appreciate, like I see where you're coming from, but everybody's not the same. As a black child, I'm dealing with generational trauma. I'm dealing with racism. I'm dealing with colorism from the black community sometimes. It's a lot on top of each other. I don't belong in this crowd. I don't belong in that crowd. If I act a certain way around white people, I'll be labeled as ghetto. If I act a certain way around, you know, black people or like I'll be, labeled as trying to act white. I learned this like at a very young age because like my elementary school did, never talked about race um, at all. And I feel like race isn't communicated well in schools. In the black community, children are expected to grow up faster. They're treated as grown-ups. They're being like suspended at higher rates and um, they're often pushed to the side or treated like they can deal with more. Now I'm being expected to act much older. And so I feel like that's yeah. like a lot of responsibilities and pressure. There's this data that says that often people look at black children as much older than they are. So the child might actually be six, but people are looking at him or her like they're 10 years old and treating them accordingly. If a black kid is acting out in class, they move towards punishing that behavior instead of getting the kid help, saying maybe something's going on at home, um, maybe this is a mental health concern. They need policies. Policies that say, we will tolerate this, we will not tolerate that. Here's what happens. First offense is this, second offense is this, third offense, you gotta get out of here. People having spaces to talk about it where they feel comfortable. In my experience, having a black person talk to me about mental health and to talk about racism openly and to call out racism in the classroom has been so beneficial because it helps me see my self-worth. When you look at pictures like people talking to therapists, it's always like a, like a white girl with blonde hair talking to her white therapist. And it's like, well, if it's only white people who need therapy, then clearly I'm fine. What I say to parents is don't beat yourself up, right? You're doing the best you can. Do not ask kids, how was your day? Because you're going to get fine. Instead, you change the question, reframe the question. Tell me something good that happened to you today. Tell me something bad that happened to you today. And then what did you think about that thing that happened to you? Keep pounding the table. You know, keep demanding that we put the resources in place and that we fund the resources that allow us to keep our children from dying by suicide. There is no indication that, we've, that we have a handle on this. There's no indication that this is getting better. 
And if we don't do something different, uh, we're going to continue down this road. Our kids are dying. They are choosing not to live anymore, and there's no indication that it's getting any better. But it can. You just heard several ways that it can from the kids themselves. And this isn't just a story about black kids, because the facts are, if your child is sitting in the same classroom as that kid, they are falling victim to a system that is not equipped to handle our kids' cries. It might be a different cry, but the tears are still the same. Just listen. You don't know what somebody needs exactly until you hear what they have to say. You don't then say, well, no, because, you know, you have a great life and no, because you're not failing your classes and no, because, you know, you have all these great friends. Letting people talk. Let me talk. Let me explain it. You have no reason to feel this way. Therefore, your feelings aren't valid, but they are valid because you're feeling like that's how you feel and how you feel is important. Let me tell you, like, what I don't tell you when I come home from school. Let me tell you about the kids who keep bothering me. Let me tell you about the fact that I don't understand my math class, but I, somehow I'm still passing. If I finish, then maybe you'll understand. Black children need to stop being isolated and treated like as other. They need to be given safe spaces. We train police officers, we train doctors and things like that in suicide prevention, but if you train the teenager that's sitting next to the teenager that's suicidal, they can recognize those signs. A lot of people are struggling and we keep it to ourselves. but I've recognized that by me being transparent, it saved my life and it's also saving other people's lives.